Hi Liz, hi Michael. Thank you for joining hi. us today. Hi Callum, nice to meet you Michael. I wondered if we might um, kickstart this discussion um, where we've broadly come together basically to talk about things in the, in the broadest possible historical, cultural meanings of that term. Um, so maybe um, the best way is to hand over to you to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what it is that you work on. Um, so Michael, maybe if I hand over to you. Okay, I'm, I'm Michael Lewis. I'm head of Portable Antiquities and Treasure at the British Museum. And I basically run the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which is a, a project to record archaeological finds uh, that are found by members of the public. Um, so that's me. Liz, did you want to... Uh... Sorry, I thought I was waiting for... Sorry, Callan, I was waiting for you to come in and do oh, something then. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, Callan, what are you doing? Oh, Callan, honestly. Yeah, so hello, I'm um, Liz Oakley-Brown. I'm lecturer in Shakespeare and Renaissance writing and literary theory and anything else I'm asked to do at the Department of uh, English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. Um, I'm currently, well, supposedly currently, writing a book um, for Routledge's new Spotlight on Shakespeare series called Shakespeare on the Surface. Um, and I'm interested in surfaces very broadly. But what I was really excited to have a conversation with you, Michael, this afternoon, and Callan, uh, was to, to really uh, learn about, about how objects are curated, I suppose. Mm. Um, I'm passionate about bringing um, my research into the classroom. And um, the course I've got in mind, that I had in mind when Callan mentioned this conversation, was a course I've been running for a couple of years, um, we were asked to develop project-based learning um, courses for the summer term for our first years and they are presented with a portfolio of topics and the one that I chose to, to devise was called Literary Things 1500 to 1700. Um, so you're working there, I'm working there with students who have never really thought about things um, critically or things at all. Mm -hmm. So that's my starting point, really, for really just wanting to get into conversation with you this afternoon. And um, as we were saying earlier in our sort of uh, prefatory chat, <laughs> um, this, this, this extraordinary situation we found ourselves in, um, find ourselves in, is kind of given me the opportunity to have a chat with people like you that I would never encounter, I don't think. So that's a good thing. Yeah. So when you mean, yeah, things for us, I suppose, mean quite different things, don't they? I mean, obviously, yeah. I'm used to dealing with objects that sometimes have a context and sometimes don't. Um, I'm guessing for you, mostly, they have a fairly clear context and provenance. Is, is that right, the objects that you're working with? Um, well, with this course, so I'm going to keep referring back to this course, otherwise it will just get very, yeah. very sort of nebulous. Um, with this course, the students, um, is it's only four weeks, and they're asked to choose an object from one of the set texts that they studied within the date parameters 1500 to 1700 in, in the first two terms. Um, so um, I just asked them to think about objects and things really, and that can be anything. Um, if we were teaching Macbeth, which we're not, uh, an mm. obvious example would be the dagger. Okay. And that's why we don't use Macbeth as an example. Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't let you use that because there's brilliant, brilliant secondary readings on that that we do use. I think Amanda Bailey's got an excellent essay in the um, Routledge Handbook of Material Culture on that very object. So the students you know, um, use that and then can't get too theoretical in four weeks, but I asked them to read Julian Le Yates's 2006 article, um, What Are Things Saying in, in Literary Studies? Okay. Um, where Julian Yates um, along the way uses oranges and he sort of maps out um, the network of oranges. So I asked them to sort of map out, choose an object and then start thinking about their object in the historical period and so on. Mm. So, so is yeah, that in so terms of what the object looks like or feels like or I mean I, how, how would you I, do that? Yeah I leave them in the first instance great teacher that I am to just you know to see what they make of a thing of an object. Right. Um, one of the texts is um, um, and it is very broadly defined one of the texts that they study in um, in the first few weeks of their course with us is the wife of Bath's tale. 
right. and um, quite a lot of them choose teeth. Okay, so um, <laughs> so it's broadly speaking, um, gapped teeth, but teeth anyway <laughs> figure figure in the um, in that in that tale quite large. So like, I think yeah, so it can be anything. Um, I can't think of any other examples offhand because they are literally they, they just go and find anything. So it's, it's an opportunity from, from a literary studies perspective to get them to read the text closely. And then, as you were saying, to think, to think about then how are you going to then contextualise? How is the text using this? But then how might the, the late medieval, late middle ages use it? Uh, and what's it signifying? Um, uh, and we take it from there. I suppose with, um, I mean, obviously, I don't know, I mean, too much about the literary side at all, but... Um, no, no, you don't have to. Really. I mean, and, and in some ways, it's kind of interesting um, to think about what you, what I would do if I was asked that task. Yeah. Because obviously, I would immediately want to try and think of an object that I and visualise it in a, a way that I would expect it to be at that period of time. But I guess, uh, I mean, is that what they do? Is that what they would, is that right. what they do? They, they can do. I mean, what we also do, we go out and if, if we can, we go out on a field trip. Obviously, we couldn't do it now. So that's a, no. a particular a shame. Um, so we have um, a wonderful Elizabethan manor house called um, Levins Hall in Cumbria. Have you heard of it in Kendall? No. no, no. Nah. And um, so we go out there and we, we kind of think about as well the ways in which objects and things are cared for, curated, how they're, how they're uh, uh, sources of comfort, but also discomfiture. So to, go, to ask them to think about things a bit more materially, really, materialistically. So for example, one, ex one thing I can remember is we were looking at wooden croquet balls. Okay. So thinking about how, how this sphere of wood was used for game um, alongside uh, metal balls that were used to, for, for cannons, to think how these metal spheres were then used for injuring. Yes. other humans so yeah so it can go and we also thought about why weren't why weren't dustbins you know things for example so we look <laughs> <laughs> so you know it, so that this kind of um field trip was really really interesting in that respect about what what what, what did a culture class as a, as a thing worth an object worth curating <laughs> yes. that's really interesting because it, that sort of falls into the work that the portable antiquity scheme is doing when you kind of pull up an object on that and you see uh -huh. the different types of classification and work that goes into um what that is doing michael which is a, a similar sort of thing but perhaps with slightly shifting parameters yeah. for how do you understand yeah. a, a jar or a, a mug yeah. yeah i guess i mean in some ways what we do is obviously the kind of the starting point of the research process in many ways because um as you as you probably know i mean most of the objects that are found through the port of antiquity scheme are found by metal detector users they're going out there obviously doing things in a very very different way to conventional archaeology finding these objects that archaeologists probably wouldn't find searching in a way certainly that archaeologists wouldn't do yeah. um and yet these objects um which sometimes in the past archaeologists probably thought were pretty rare you know they find in substantial numbers and of course you know what our job is within the scheme is to record these objects on an online database believing hoping i guess as well that if this information about these objects isn't captured then mm -hmm. it will be lost forever but also that this information can then be used by other people and like i said um sort of before we kind of was on there i mean it's kind of um it's, it's interesting how people use that information because obviously the detectorists themselves will go on the Port of Antiquity Scheme database to look at parallels for the objects that they found. So they, they found <laughs> something, they want to see something similar to it. Um, archaeologists, of course, use it to understand the landscape and the relationship between object types. So there's a lot of us actually that become quite fascinated about the classification, the structure, etc., mm -hmm. of the, the object. And of course, these are just completely artificially made up in many ways by us as humans, but to mm -hmm. understand what the relationship between these objects are. And then of, of course, there are people who are very interested, which is what it, really one of the reasons we do it, in the relationship between these objects and the, the places that they were found and what those relationships are with other sorts of structure, structures, buildings that were, were there in the past or just landscapes and mm. that sort of thing. But a challenge I think for us is how do we make this information more usable to a wider audience? So people like yourself who mm. are academics in a completely different field to us, you know, there's a lot of information, a lot of data here, but um, I know when we had the workshop in Canterbury, people were saying, um, 
you know, well, how would you how would you use this information? How, how we'd like we like the, the fact that it exists, but how do we use it in our work and our research? And then, of course, there's the wider public. Why would they look at this information? What are they looking at it for? So um, there's lots of different aspects to it, really. But I'm I'm quite keen, of course, that it's it has a wider use mm. than what it does at the moment. I mean, something that occurs to me as you were talking there is that, you know, um, we can't always go out on field trips because of lots of reasons. You know, COVID-19 is one of them. Um, <laughs> finances is another, you know, and also timetabling uh, to try and get students all together uh, at the same time to go out for a day is really hard in, in the current climate. So I'm thinking something like the, um, your database would be great to use um, in, in, the, in a teaching scenario. Um, I actually am really unfamiliar with the database. So could you describe it to me? Other people might find it helpful too. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, I mean, obviously the first thing is it's um, the, the web link is, is www.finds.org.uk. So you can go to that um, and you can have a look. Um, it, it's, it's simple in many ways. I mean, it's just a, an inventory of all of the archaeological material that's been found by the public. We've got on the database at the moment, 1.4 million objects, almost 1.5. Wow. Um, they've all been found by the public, which is amazing in itself. Yeah. So it's a, a public contribution to our knowledge of the past. Um, and as I said, most of them are found by um, metal detector users. What we record is obviously a description of the object, images in most cases um, of the finds, and we've, we've become quite um, strict in the way that that information is kind of um, recorded and uh, made available as well. The fine spot, although to the general public that's kind of restricted to some extent because many metal detectorists are concerned that um, kind of naughty detectors, as, <laughs> as you might say, might go onto their land and, mm. and find objects perhaps even without permission. So the fine spot's restricted but we do make that available for research purposes. Um, and then other things that you'd expect like the dimension, the weight and all of that sort of stuff. So it's a, an archaeological sort of catalogue really. In terms of the data, um, I mean, it obviously goes from everything that's created since man started making objects, so way back into the Stone Age, um, and then it goes right up in theory to the modern period, although um, the Fines Liaison Officers, so we have archaeologists across the mm -hmm. country whose job is to record these objects, um, we tend to be, we tend not to record things after 1700s so that's quite in, and and also um we're kind of quite selective after about 1550. Mm. So obviously with your period we're starting to become selective in what we record and what we don't mm. and maybe that's a, an interesting thing to discuss because we are obviously making those decisions mm. um based on our perceptions of value um mm. in terms of objects, you know historical archaeological value mm. um and one of the one of the kind of drivers behind that is that once things be start to become industrially produced, are they worth as much from an archaeological perspective as they, they might be um, when they're, they're, they're man-made, as it were, <laughs> completely man-made or made mm. by hand? Um, that's really interesting to me. The, um, so I'm very much interested in sort of um, the politics of, of curation, I suppose, for want of yeah. a better term. Um, and I and I think I am yeah personally very interested on how how your how your dates between say 1550 and 1700 start to get fuzzy, I guess. Because or, or, what, sorry, what you archive and record becomes sort of I'm going to say arbitrary in a way because yeah. or more arbitrary because because of manufacture because of different ways of, of technology, I suppose. Yeah. Um, do you have a set of guidelines that, you know, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to get them out and sort of <laughs> show them to me in some sort of militant fashion, but just, I'm just interested in how you, how you sort of uh, arbitrate, how you make a decision. Yes. Can you think well, of an example? Quite... I've put you on the spot a bit. No, no, you, no, you haven't. I mean, it's, it's kind of, um, it is quite tricky actually, because mm. obviously most archeologists will traditionally have taken the view that all of these objects should be recorded and ideally they should enter museum collections. Well, the Portable Antiquity Scheme is very different to that in many ways mm. because um, we realise that most of the objects that we see are never going to be seen again. The, the finders basically will hold on to them yeah. once they've been recorded. So they go into private collections that then they're, they're not available anymore. And so in some ways it makes the question even more important because 
it is a one-off opportunity to record these objects. Mm. The reality of the situation is that there's more people out there searching and finding objects than we can deal with. Mm. So some of the reasons that we make these decisions is from a very practical perspective. And there is a kind of a view amongst um, archaeologists more generally that the more ancient past is more interesting and more important than the, the more recent past, mm. which, uh, you know, it, it can be quite, quite wrong. I mean, like, like you say as well, there's a, there, there can be differences, not in terms of the date of the objects, but also within the local context. So, for mm. example, if you go further uh, west in parts of the country, then you obviously don't get much in, in terms of Roman presence, where in other parts of the country, it's completely dominates. And mm. just to give you a, a case in point, I mean, the database itself is 50% roughly Roman material. Mm. Um, so it kind of completely dominates. So sometimes the finds liaison officers are making decisions on whether the objects from the places they're found are adding to that local knowledge. Mm. So for example, if you've got a, a well-known um, area of Roman settlement and you're getting more and more Roman objects, then are they as important as something that's completely different to that mm. in, in the same sort of place? The problem with the post-medieval period more, more generally is just this amount of um, material that's obviously being produced yeah. um, and then how you, you deal with that. I mean, there are things on the database that are very, very modern um, and the finds liaison officers have, have sort of taken a judgment that they're important um, because they tell them something about the locality that otherwise would be sort of missing. Mm. So it might be something like a button that's been manufactured yeah. locally or a token is a good example. Yeah. You know, the big ones that you seem to get all dated to 1660 something. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there seems to be loads of them and um, you know they they are um, obviously quite important because they name individuals and they have places mm -hmm. and so you can relate these objects to a particular place I mean we do have guidelines of course that help you know the fines liaison officers make these decisions some of them are quite broad um, things that we do so like I said generally speaking we try to be fairly systematic in what we record up to about 1550 other than that, um, it may be whether the objects being recorded tie into work that people are doing, um, yeah. archaeological works or maybe um, research work as well. So obviously it's useful to know, you know what people are studying, what they're interested in, mm. looking into the more modern periods, I guess. Um, and a, a crucial thing is this, this fine spot that I talked about before. I mean, if an object doesn't have a very good fine spot, then its value from our perspective diminishes rapidly. Um, so you could have something, you know, from the Anglo-Saxon period, you know, obviously very important, um, but does, is, is um, you know, that doesn't have a fine spot or it has a very, very poor fine spot. And unless that object is particularly significant in its own right, then there's a big question mark about whether we would record it. Mm. And the other way around, you know, there might be something that's, that's very, very common, you know, like a Roman coin or um, post-medieval coinage or some, <clears throat> some jewellery aspect for example but we might decide to record even um just because the fine spot is like a what we'd call a a, a six or eight figure grid reference so it's accurate to a square for example so um they're they're the sorts of decisions that put, that people are making but it's, it's i think the point is that every object you record you have to try and think about how it could be used by mm. someone else and how valuable that information is and as an archaeologist one of our biggest starting points is the fine spot if that's the kind of that's the first stage if it doesn't pass the first stage mm. then what's the point of it it's just another object as it were it's so interesting to hear a sort of about the, the centrality of provenance and and sort of place as you were saying and um sorry i don't want to interrupt liz but i wonder if i might um throw open another broad question um mm. which is and so Andy Kesson spoke with the historian Susanna Lipscomb last week, and they were sort of talking about ways into history, particularly sort of through documents. Um, and whereas what we're talking about and what both your kind of uh, approaches are in what we're uh, covering today is a, an approach to the past that's object centred. And I just wondered whether um, either of you wanted to talk a little bit about what it means to take the object as the kind of starting point rather than the written word or the story or the narrative. Um, that comes out of the past and what we might get from that. Can I start? Um, yeah. 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 Well, for me, I think um, it 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 takes um, the human, often the the white man, out of the narrative, or at least sidelines them. 
Uh, <laughs> if that's all right to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a what you know. I, I'm or people of privilege, let's say, uh, and I'm just using that should have scare quotes around it. Whiteman. Um, for me, it enables us to think about a different genealogy um, of the past, if you like, uh, uh, and our relationship to it, and our relationship to the world in general. I think that. It, um, I also teach later on, sort of second and third year, I actually teach, you know, after Bill Brown thing theory and stuff like that. And it, indeed stuff, yeah, I teach a lot of stuff as well. So um, for me, there's a theoretical uh, aspect to this as well. But because I'm, I'm focusing in our discussion this afternoon really on the first year course, which is really where um, we, we're just trying to, as, as a group, think about objects and things and, and in the way we are really, um, to some extent. Um, it just it's a, it's a different way of, of thinking about um, the past and our access to it, I think, and, and who, who, who then has a voice, who doesn't, um, and so on, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think objects are sort of levellers in a way, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and I think one thing that with the objects that I'm used to dealing with is that they are not, I mean, there are obviously some objects that are absolutely amazing in their own right. And they were obviously owned by people with status. Mm. But most of the objects that we record aren't. And in fact, you know, one of the activities, we did a blog for the Middle East culture that, that I did that looked at um, um, dress hooks and tried mm. to work out, you know, what, who, what sort of people would have owned these objects. Now, some of them, are very obviously super ornate, you know, gilded, made in precious metals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. And you can assume that they are for people who are more wealthy than most. Yeah. Um, but then, obviously, there's a lot of other objects that are or could have been used by all sorts mm. of people mm. from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things I find with archaeological objects is trying to work out that who were the people that owned these objects. Mm. It's almost impossible most of the time, I think. Um, but, it, but it is interesting because um, sort of like I was saying before, I mean, there may be in a museum, particularly in museums, you, obviously there's a focus on probably the better objects, the most interesting, the most complete, um, the most precious, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet through archeology, span we've got this a mass of other material. And occasionally it will be the case that, uh, well not occasionally, but often an archeologist will find in the past, um, one or two objects um, because there's no other parallels for them they'll <coughs> assume that these are um, associated with really high status people mm. then lo and behold you know Mr Metal Detectors guy will come and find you know 20 or 30 of the same things and then soon you'll have a database of them that's completely uh, like we do that's got loads and loads of this material and then suddenly are these really associated with the people that we thought they were or mm. are they more common than mm. we as well and I think that that is fascinating to try and think about who are these people behind these objects. Mm. And indeed, the detectors, when they find these objects, they love the idea that they are the first person, they don't know this for certain, but they think they're the first person ever to have touched that object mm. since it was mm. dropped in the, the Roman period, the medieval period, the Tudor period, whatever. Um, and they love the idea that it's that tangible link with someone who owned this object in the past. Mm and think about how they may have lost it and all of that sort of stuff. I think that's really the idea of affect and, and the embodiment, I mean, the embodied sense, as I was saying earlier about when we go to Levin's Hall and we can actually touch these old objects from all kinds of periods, really. Um, we do spend a little bit of time thinking about how it feels to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think as well, in, in terms of literature, you just made me think about what, what the students are doing quite often is, is to to take out um, from, to extract from the literary text quite quotidian objects actually like a bowl or something and then to think well what's a 15th century bowl look like yeah. you know, what material is it made of so we're not always looking for the spectacular things well they don't always look for the spectacular things I'm not doing anything at all because it's really up to them so they surprise me sometimes with the fact they think well I just want to see what a 15th century bowl might be as opposed to one from Ikea Yes. And, and again, how do we, I mean, these are obviously the objects that we are familiar with, of course, are the ones that survive. And we never really know how representative yeah. they are, do we? Exactly. Um, which is, I think, kind of fascinating itself, because obviously you have these inventories and such like mm -hmm. that mention these sorts of objects. Um, but they don't really, as far as I'm aware, describe them in much detail often, do they? No. So 
difficult to know what they're talking about is anything that we've ever seen um, before or not. Yeah, and I think, um, as I say, I think some students, as I say, do actually go and take the voice of everyday object that is kind of almost a throwaway remark in the text we're looking at. And they, they do get quite, you know, in, well, get very interested in thinking about the materials, the fabrics, how it was made. And the fact it's just kind of popped up in this text as a sort of, you know, just as a, as a, as a sort of a part, part of setting the scene, if you like. Um, it just gives a very different, I think, um, engagement with the text in, in all kinds of ways. Mm. I wonder if um, um, I might throw open a question. It seems like a good point to do so. Um, you mentioned the word literature. Um, <laughs> and of course, we work in kind of English literature departments. Um, and one of the questions that we're asking everybody um, who comes and speaks here on a bit lit is what that word means to them and how um, what they do um, might kind of shape their understanding of that term. And I think we've been talking about kind of the quotidian and sort mm. of pop shoots of um, how <coughs> that can inform literature. So I just I just wondered, yeah, how you might go about answering that rather large <laughs> question. Of what does literature mean to you? Gosh, you better go for first, Liz, because I've, I've got no clue, really, what literature means to me, in a way. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you go first, and then... Well, I'm not sure that I have, really. I have to say that um, I spend a lot of my time, actually, something I'm doing at the moment um, around this lovely conversation is thinking about curriculum and assessment mapping piece of uh, admin. So, so I do spend a lot of time thinking about what our courses are called, what, what we're asked to call them by, um, by UCAS and so on. So literature, actually, I find it was a very complicated uh, topic. For me, uh, it is predominantly anything that uses a science system that is writing, even though, you know, so for me, it's really broad. I, I try not to bring in sort of um, hierarchies of value judgments, but of course I'm making them even if I'm not aware that I am. So that, that for me is, is literature. It's, right. it's really tricky. That's why I paused. Yeah. <laughs> I think, in, I suppose, yeah, I, maybe I should have gone first because you've influenced my thought a little bit. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I suppose in my, <laughs> in, in my mind, I mean, I do see it very book based. I don't know why, but in a, in probably in a, you know, a fiction sort of way, in, in a way, when I think of literature, maybe this is making no sense whatsoever, mm. but I do just see it as, um, things that are written in books that are people's opinions um, mm. rather than fact. And, and you're right, of course, that it's a wider term than that. I mean, I kind of, in my mind, maybe I'm wrong here, but I see inventories as being a bit more factual and to the point and mm. literature as that kind of gloss on it where people kind of say mm. what they think um, and feel, which in some ways is quite nice because obviously you get an in, a different sort mm. of insight into people. But then it becomes less, um, I guess it becomes just less factual, probably, um, because of that. Callum, what do you think? I mean, you must, have you must have defined this a million times now, but I'm... <laughs> Not at all. I know, I'm, I'm <laughs> as well. Um, I don't know, I just think this idea of literacy is quite interesting, um, which is, mm. you know, the idea that you can read. Um, but yeah. as we've just been discussing, you can also read surfaces or you can read objects. So mm. I like that elastic sense of what literature mm. is. Um, Andy spoke in one of the early videos of this series about how lit the term literature carries with it quite a lot of baggage essentially mm. um, coming out of that 18th century idea of what is noble, what is good, you know it, it sounds almost like a value judgment um, mm. and this is often something we talk with students about when we first introduce them to the subject of English literature. Uh, but I don't know I quite like the rather well, rogue idea of considering a lot of the uh, objects that you have in the in the portable antiquity scheme database to be forms of literature because we're reading yes. them and they're helping mm -hmm. us read things well um, in a sort of more purist sense of course there's objects that do have words on them um for whatever reason and um i think one of the things that's quite fascinating particularly in the medieval period is we get objects with inscriptions that are either mm. completely made up they don't sort of made um any sense whatsoever um, and then others that seem to be pseudo um, correct, I guess. I mean, they, you know, obviously in Latin normally, and they they do seem to be trying to make sense. And they, and they, they kind of open up to me the idea or the thoughts about where, whether it mattered to a lot of people, whether the words were mm -hmm. correct or not. 
Mm. I mean, is it the case, for example, that some of these objects, it just matters that there's words on it that might have some sort of meaning? Or did they actually have to know what those words meant? Um, and obviously, as you go on through time into the, into the, uh, you know, the Tudor period, obviously you get the use of kind of French much more um, besides Latin. And again, you kind of wonder, OK, people have got now these these sentences on these objects seem to or these kind of abbreviations seem to make much more sense. And of course, you get it on coinage pretty much all the way through. Um, but did most people really care about that? And I guess coinage is an interesting one in that respect, because I mean, we all handle coins pretty much every day, not the moment probably, but most days we do. And we probably don't have much of an indication on what's on these objects at all. We're using them every day. And I don't think anyone could probably say what the inscription is on a, a two pound coin, for example, let alone perhaps what even the images are. So it does make me wonder, um, I know it's obviously difficult to kind of put modern views in, in the past, but it kind of does make me wonder why words are written on objects sometimes. And then, like you say, um, there's the other aspect to them that maybe the objects in their own right are a, a, a word of, a way of communicating that kind of transcends the use of kind of letters and things like that. Which is where I think kind of then a bit of modern critical theory comes in really handy, if I may just introduce it, as I tend to do in everything. Um, <laughs> things like, you know, Roland Barthes and the idea of semiotics kind of takes us into all kinds of exciting areas, which is what our students will then um, be able to um, not just theorise, but think about uh, as, as their studies progress. So your question, Callan, is a great one about what is literature, because as their, as their degree goes on, you know, they, they'll get the theoretical, um, analytical vocabulary to actually help them um, explain that far more coherently than I am this afternoon. <laughs> mm. Well, thank you both so much for coming on, uh, coming on and speaking about this. It's been a pleasure to hear a little bit more um, about both of your approaches to things. Yeah, and it's been great to meet you, Michael. Thank you very much. I've learned loads, and thank well, you, Callan. To meet you yeah. as well. I think I don't understand your world at all, really, at the moment. I feel like a bit left out in that respect. But yeah. Well, if um, if when the course runs again, if there's any money, we'll get you up to come and talk about the the, the portable antiquities oh, well, project. Great, I that because it's um, I've learned loads this afternoon. Thank you ever so much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you See you soon. Bye. Bye.